please help yourself. Yes, food. food. And drinks. All right, let's get started. This is the first banner ad. Created for an AT&T advertising campaign in 1994, it is perhaps the most influential thing ever to happen to the internet. No single thing has done more to change, deform, alter, or make sustainable the internet. And when it launched, it had a 44% CTR. That stands for click-through rate. That means almost half of the people who saw this ad did exactly that. They clicked right there. It was made with the best of intent. The idea was to make a uniquely internet style of ads. It would take you to a different place, it would work within the structure of the web, and it would connect you to advertisers, content, and experiences in a way unique to this new platform for communications. And it would be everywhere in short order. It was duplicated across the internet and there would be a problem because the people who went on to implement the banner ad didn't think much about what it could do or how it could work. And now, the virus that is the banner ad has mutated into the modern advertising system. And along the way, there have been some consequences. Print publications have fallen apart, unable to find a way to keep their doors open in a web advertising world. The presence of particular type of web ads have contributed greatly to the decline in trust in media. It could be argued that web advertising severely impacted the 2016 election, perhaps the concept of democracy as a whole. It's impacted traditional news sites by implanting untrustworthy bits inside them, and it made untrustworthy sites profitable by valuing eyeballs without considering what it means to monetize the loudest voices. Just making sure all of these things are properly muted so they don't beep at us. Okay, there we go. And it seems like the world of news media has been falling apart for a decade now. It's been messy, it's been collapsing, and it's bad for business and bad for journalism. If journalism isn't broken, it still has suffered a severe wound, and it seems like web advertising has pushed in the knife, and it's been doing so for a while now. A lot of you have brought your laptops. Show of hands, how many of you are currently running an ad blocker, or ghostery, or brave? Exactly. And you are here because you're interested in the very industry that's being driven by those advertisements. We've had 20 years to evolve from that first advertising, that first banner ad. But to most of us, it seems like no evolution has happened. When most of us think of ads, we think of this. A constant, unrelenting attack by banner ads we want nothing to do with. What happened? Where did it all go wrong? What can we do about it? Hello, I'm Aram Zuckerscharf, and now that we're settled in, I'll take a moment to introduce myself. I'm the Director of Advertising Technology Engineering at the Washington Post, and I work with teams across the organization to help the Post make money in a variety of different ways, and through our ARC platform, help other publishers make money. Um, I've taken a very long road to this point. At one point, I was a journalist. I was a community manager. I wrote for video games, a variety of different paths that brought me to here. And it's given me a very unique view on the world of the media business and on advertising technology. I've spent a lot of time as an engineer, and I've spent time on the journalism side, and now I think on the strategy side as well. And I'm here to bring that viewpoint to you and hopefully teach you a, little things, a few things from it. If you have any questions, there'll be good moments to pause and hash stuff out. It would also be great if you could tweet them at me. There's a hashtag, also my Twitter handle. I'll be watching the tweets and embedding them later on. And uh, if there's a point you especially enjoyed or wish we dove more into, you can hashtag that as well. Oops. Um, additionally, ah, here are slides. This link will take you to a Q&A area for the slides. I'm going to turn that on and off at regular times when there's sort of like a Q&A space. So keep an eye out for that. So let's back up a little bit to a more profitable time for the journalism industry. When we printed everything on paper and all that computers were good for was laying out those pages using tools like Quark, which you see here. Back in the day, even as recently as the 90s, publishers could rake it in. They were printing news and printing money and it seemed like an unlimited well. Why was this? There were a number of reasons, but the first has to do with intent. 
At least at the beginning, especially when dealing with local papers, ad sales required a particular level of connection with the same community your journalism was serving. You couldn't sell local ads without local salespeople, and they needed to connect to the community the same way that journalists did. The ads, like the journalism, were designed to provide a service to your readers. That's an, there's another factor that led to early success involved in that as well. When ads were placed, they were placed manually by humans who had awareness of the content and context they were going into. Newspapers as print editions were a product, same as you might think of an app today. The ads placed were done so symbiotically. Make no mistake, every issue was a product, and because of that, it had to be created with planning and intent. So what happened in print? Well, I have a little simulation here for you all to participate in. If you go to this address, you will enter my 90s newspaper business simulator. I'm going to bring this up on the other screen there. Let's yeah, see if this works. Your ad blocker is turned on. Yes. Um, I'm going to try and mirror this display. Yep, that is working. OK, so you should be able to see this. I'm going to walk you through how this works very quickly. So this is the simulator. You will see your first page, your current profits, and your distribution. You can add pages, commission stories, or sell ads. Every newspaper page is a 3 by 3 grid with nine squares. And you have, every ad says what grids it takes up. And every news story you commission takes up either two squares across, two squares down, you can rotate it by clicking, or three squares across, also able to rotate by clicking. You don't have to place every story, but you do have to place every ad. And you cannot ship your paper unless you have filled all but one square on every single page. So you, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. I want you to go at it as fast as you can. Try and build as profitable a newspaper as you can. And as you do so, I'd like you to pay attention to how your newspaper distribution goes up when you drag different things into the page. You can see here, that's me shipping an ad. This is me placing an article. And also pay attention to those net profits. Um, we'll be talking about both of these things a little bit later. And I just want you to see how far you can go. Once you get to the end, and I will call it at about five to 10 minutes, um, I will uh, ask you to try and ship your paper. If you can, if you've put all the squares in, you'll get the option to tweet out your score. And we can take a look at what everyone's score is on the hashtag. So go at it. Yes. Uh, oop, let's. Switch it back. And... Hmm. What? Is there a way to control the length of the story variable? Because I'm trying to put the story there and yeah. that here. Is that? Oh, it's too big. Yeah, it's too big. So, how do I control it? The content can only be two squares, or two squares, or three squares. Um, hold on, I gotta get the uh, link back up. Interesting. Apparently, I have disappeared my presentation. Is it up there? Oh, there it is. So yeah, please tell me if you've got any questions. Um, this was um, the length of this story. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want a smaller ad, how do I put it in? So, so far, your salespeople have only sold you a 3 by 2 ad and a 1 by 3 ad. Or do they need to sell more ads or put some of those ads into I'm the ads? I'm trying to put this ad in the ship here. No, just look. Scroll down. This ad is a 1 by 3. So this is a single square. There is a one by one ad, but you don't have one yet. You can drag this one back out and into the toolbar. 
and then direct the one by three to the side of the page. So yeah. Yeah. Um, a quick note here as well. Um, in order to resize an ad, you have to, in, in order, sorry, in order to resize content, you have to drag it back to the toolbox and click on it there. You can't resize it in the layout. Wait, say that again? You can resize. So you can switch the rotation of your content right. um, by dragging it back to the toolbox and clicking on it as if it was spawned. I'm going to switch this back to use to mirror. Yeah. So like this, you can drag it back and rotate it. No, see, they're just a little smaller here, but it says what it is. This is a three by two, so it goes three long, two down, and there's only nine squares on the page. But this is actually a good fit because a three by two fits right in there, and you can add another page. Right, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, you got a whole page. That's good. You can ship that page. Some some will pay you for that page. But my profit has actually um even more I'm losing even more money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, the experience of starting with the newspaper business. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hold it. Do you think I can get a quick photo here? Sure, sure. Um, put this, you know, put the presentation up behind me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, use a separate display. And now I know what happens at this presentation. I can find it again. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Can I change the dimensions of that ad when I or sell ad? Nope. Your your sales people have sold the ad, and you got to deal with what they're giving you. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, the one by one story. Like, uh, mm -hmm. This is where I'm mean, actually yeah, scrolling. Control. 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 Is there a way to backtrack like, the pages and go back? Not the already the story. Okay, so one by one. Okay. There's only an ad. All stories are two by two. Or sorry, two by one or one by two or one by three. And you can cut off. So like this one's one by three, that one's one by two. Is that, yeah. that, yeah. I didn't uh, sure. remember and I should uh, Yeah. And you can always drag ads out of the paper and into the toolbar. I'm going to walk behind all of you to pick the computers, see how they go. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen a 90s era newspaper, but that's not how I describe them. I don't know what the issue is. So, to give you some additional context as you're going up, you are paying for each story and you are getting money for each ad. Um, you must place all the ads, right? And any story you pay for, any story you pay for does not help you. You could not, potentially not have published it. But once you place it on a paper, that story can increase your reputation. So you're potentially getting higher distribution, even though you're paying for the story. 
How is your distribution numbers driven by the number of stories? The number of stories and the number of pages. Okay, so uh, is anyone in the green yet? Yeah. Not yet, huh? <laughs> okay. Why does distribution go up when you add a page? More pages looks more impressive. So distribution goes up a little bit from page adding, and distribution goes up from adding stories. For anyone who uh, bleeding money, <laughs> bleeding money. <laughs> gotta add more pages and more ads then. For anyone who has ever had to lay out a print newspaper, this process is probably alarmingly similar, but hopefully a little bit more colorful. Okay, this is your uh, two-minute warning. Hopefully somebody makes it to profitable by the time we uh, are done. Remember, you can't have empty pages, and your pages must have all but at one box filled. Oh, did you have a question? It, at least it looks good, right? There you go. Hey, you got a couple more. You got like one more minute. Okay, here we go. Ship it if you can, and tweet out your scores. Let me see them on the hashtag, if you can ship it. Just gotta hit the ship button. <laughs> you did do a lot of pages. More ads. Pages full of ads. It's at chronotope, C-H-R-O-N-O-T-O-P-E. It should be in the hashtag. Okay, so um, is there anything people noticed from the simulation? Um, anything that you noticed as you were going through it that you discovered? Perhaps it was very difficult, especially starting off, to have 
a lot of content versus a lot of ads, that there was an immediate dip when you started as it cost more money to produce more pages and you weren't making more money. Perhaps some of you got to the point where you were profitable and you started to notice at first your numbers were matching your distribution and then they started exceeding your distribution. Well, we're going to talk about something that was not a thing so much in the 90s, but a thing now that you were experiencing if you got to that point of profitability. It's called the hockey stick. So some of you may have gotten to the point where your distribution growth was linear. That means going up in a straight line. But your profits were growing exponentially. That means multiplying. Um, this process of exponential growth, which is chased by many modern startups, including new startups, is called hockey stick growth. And it's why at the end of the last century, newspapers were doing so well. In the 90s, the Sunday edition of the New York Times, including various inserts, would be composed of over 300 pages. There's a reason. As you may have noticed, a lot of those pages had to be filled with ads, but if they were, you could make a lot of money. Some companies see this type of growth as a goal, but the further you get along that hockey stick, the more disconnected you become from your users. The easier it is to miss change, and the easier you become to topple. So, on that subject, let's look at the New York Times on the internet. The first version of the website arrived in 1996. It was pretty basic. It was one of, if not one of, it was one of the earliest mainstream publications on the web. And you can see there's very few ads and they attempt to duplicate how they are laid out on print. In 1997, the ads were purged from the front page. In 98, ads returned to the front page. Here comes the consideration of above and below the fold. You'll notice that there are some ads right there, that luxury and performance, probably for some type of car. Um, that ad is above the fold, which means they can sell it for more because it's guaranteed to be visible as soon as the user loads the page. And this ad for Barnes & Nobles is below the fold. You would have had to have scrolled to it to get to it. This is adopted from print parlance where there was literally a fold. People had to unfold your paper to see the ads below that fold. By 2006, we're pretty much on the path to the modern New York Times homepage. On this page, you can see five banner ads above the fold, a sponsor logo at the very top. Phillips is giving you free access. I'm, giving the, I'm using the New York Times as an example here especially because it's very well archived. Thank you to them for that. And, but the lack of ads and the literal side tracking of ads between the launch of news organizations around the web and the present day is there in most war news sites today. Are these ads integrated the way they were into content? Does content flow around them? For the most part, no. Ads are moved to the side out of the mindset of developers and designers. Because news organizations saw continuous, enormous growth in print, they mostly didn't pay attention to the web. They didn't want to deal with it. Their executives and salespeople didn't look at making it an integrated process. Why would they? They had that runaway growth of their paper ad sales. They left the building of ads and ad technology online to someone else. They said, here's the thing, this thing on the web. Here's some white space off to the side. We don't want to deal with it. Let's let someone else figure it out. And other people did start figuring it out. For years, display ads would grow on a variety of platforms and in a variety of ways. And, for the most part, without news organizations' involvement. When news organizations treat their ad inventory on the web as an afterthought, they let it grow and change and be populated onto their page with no particular intent of their own. And they ended up with an ad system unplanned, disconnected, and disconnected from their page, their content, their readers, and most importantly, their ethics. Our business is now no longer aligned with our ethical responsibilities as journalistic organizations. And because of that, it's failing. So what was the original sin of digital media? Was it giving away content for free, as some people have said? It's always been a false assertion. There's always been free papers. And when they existed, they were powered by the same things that are powering our free websites, advertisements. The difference now is the control of the ad space was given away for free given away to companies that don't share news organizations' interests, 
methodologies, or ethics for making money on the internet. So, now that we understand the issue, let's talk about its impact and the tools we can deploy to fix it. So, I'm going to be talking about stuff on the web throughout this presentation. Um, here are some options for setting up a website if you do not have one. If you do not have one, that's all right if you don't want to make one right now. Um, but I did want to draw your attention to some of the options here. Um, Glitch.com, which was the host of the simulation that you just played, allows you to make a free website very quickly. You can log in with your Facebook account, and you can use it to test out some of the stuff that we went over here. Um, additionally, GitHub.com has a great uh, setup for free web pages. It's a little bit more complicated. You have to use Markdown. Um, we can talk about that at a later point. And there's also Reclaim Hosting. If you have a .edu email address, they will host you for free and give you access to a whole variety of great tools. Um, and additionally, you can get started playing with ads today. You can sign up for Google's ad service. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So this is my blog, Hack Text. I need to update it more frequently, obviously. But three days ago, I turned on AdSense, which is Google's free-to-use ad service, and stuck the AdSense script at the top of my page. Now, the AdSense script, by default, just throws ads wherever it thinks it can and wherever it thinks it should and targets them towards me by a bunch of different factors. We'll get into those later. This ad... Sort of well-placed, not particularly relevant. There's a whole bunch of these ads, which are real ugly and super interruptive and also pretty confusing. Oh, there's another one. And then there are, on the bottom, these long banner ads, which think they're in a sidebar and are not placed appropriately at all. This is the default setting of the ad product from Google on my website. I didn't modify it in any way. Um, so you can eventually set up more complicated controls and set it up, but it is telling that this default setup is pretty invasive. It's not particularly relevant, and it's just not great ads. Um, this is a great illustration of how, even though you can set up these ads on your site, there's a lot of work to make them actually good for your readers and for your site. Oh, we'll switch back. Okay. Um, there'll be some pauses, and if you are going to set up your own website and you would, are doing that as you're listening to me, please ask questions during those pauses. So, let's go forward. To get the right ads in print, Ad sellers would present their publication's connection with the community, the topics of their publication, and polls with collected demographic data about the audience uh, that was reading their newspapers. Advertisers have always chased the holy grail of getting the right ad in front of the right person at the right time. With paper, you had to hope the reader was paying attention. Maybe they'd cut a coupon, but generally most um, print advertising is what's called an awareness play, which means they're counting on you to see that ad, let's say for Burger King, um, and you're not gonna clip the coupon, you're not gonna clip the ad, you're not gonna put it in a frame, but the next time you're thinking about where you wanna go out to eat, you think Burger King, because of the ad. It's increasing your awareness of their brand. But digital ads aren't part of the content. They're divorced from it, pulled away, shoved into corners, Today's generation of websites is only just getting back to integrating ads into content and the overall user flow, but when they started, and even now on most websites, it's an entirely different affair. Ads are shoved away, tucked into the corners, a last resort for when websites thought they could sustain themselves without advertisement. But this has produced user experiences that are, at best, problematic. The end result of shoving ads to one side was our very site design has taught users to ignore ads. Even though banner ads like the one we saw at the beginning of this presentation remain the most prominent format for ads, they mostly go unseen. 
This phenomenon has become so ingrained that it's starting to leak off the web into real life. Now, 65% of people don't even look at banner ads on your website. And that behavior, well, we're going to see exactly how it leaks into real life. So get ready, pay close attention, watch that screen. Okay, tell me what offices you're voting for at the end of these flashed items. Okay, so that was a real poll for voting in Florida. Can anyone tell me what the offices you were voting for were? Not the individual people, just the offices. Governor? Lieutenant Governor? Nothing else? No, no, Governor was the first one. No, you missed it, along with a lot of Florida voters. The representative for Congress, 13th District. Nobody voted for him. Why? Because it's at the top. And it's designed in the same configuration relative to this content like a banner ad. Eye tracking experiments on these very layouts determined that people didn't even see who to vote for Congress or that they were even supposed to. Banner blindness in real life. So if there's a percentage of votes, cast actually voted for that. Yes. Um, this presentation, which I will provide the link to, has links to all the articles that are, these are coming from, and I encourage you to check them out later. Um, making this issue worse is how people read web pages. This F shape you see here is the underlying commonality among eye tracking studies of web pages. As you can see, particular zones do catch the reader's attention, and if you don't do so, you're likely to lose them. Um, in this one, they eventually run out of things so that the eye to be interested in. And this one, something catches their attention a little bit later. And that pattern is still broken because the readers just do not want to even look at ads. These colors represent where the eyeball was looking at, and the highlighted areas bordered in yellow are ad units. As you can see in these eye tracking studies, people weren't just looking and then ignoring ads, they weren't even seeing them. So to show you what that eye tracking study looks like, here is a video of someone scanning CNN. Um, this is a version of CNN from a little while back, as you can see by this wonderful version of Internet Explorer. The blue dot with the line indicates where the person's eyes are looking on the page. As you can see, for the most part, they haven't even noticed the ads, um, nor are their eyeballs interacting with them, lingering on them, or paying any attention to them, much less likely to click on them. You can see this person's navigating a dropdown, which is not great user. They're looking to search. They're looking for all sorts of things. Ads, not their concern. So how long has this been a problem? Banner blindness? We've been seeing these same types of web ads pretty much exactly like that first banner since the web has begun for 20 years. They haven't changed. This is an article by a major design and U.S. testing firm on displaying banner ads that recognize the problem. And when did it come out? Zoom and enhance. 1997. This has been a problem since way before Web 2.0. It's been a problem for a long time. And websites needed to find alternate approaches, a way to get users' attention. Now, some approaches have been pretty clever. Ways to get around the ads of banners, uh, the way get around banner ads being fundamentally invisible. As you can see in these two examples, people have discovered through eye tracking that we pay attention to faces. This is the reason why when you're on Facebook, so many of those ads use faces. Um, especially on social networks like Facebook, where we are trained to look for people, but just in general. If you ever had to lay out a print newspaper, you probably had an editor that told you to put a face on a front page. This is the reason. People pay attention to faces. But it's more than that. We track eye lines when we look at pages. As you can see, this same page on one side has a baby looking straight at you. Nobody's reading the rest of the page. But if the baby's looking at the text, you're going to read the rest of the text. So this makes a huge difference in how people scan the page. Also, prominent images like videos in highly textual situations can draw attention. Um, consider the F shape and how it's impacted by people scanning this page 
in this example from when Google started putting videos on the front of search engine resource pages, right? Because it's right there at the very beginning of the eye scan, it's drawing their attention and they're sitting on it. A good design, a good way to attract attention. Other approaches for breaking through banner blindness have proven somewhat less effective. These are pop-ups. To quote the inventor of the pop-up, it was a way to associate an ad with the user's page without putting it directly on the page, which advertisers worried would imply an association between their brand and the page's content. Specifically, the pop-up ad came to being when a major car company freaked out because they had brought a banner ad on a page that celebrated anal sex. From the inventor of the, the pop-up ad, I wrote the code to launch the window and run an ad in it. I'm sorry, our intentions were good. <laughs> You may notice this is a common theme, a very similar sentiment to, uh, by the inventor of the banner ad. This was not good design. It was not planned. It was a way to get money disconnected from the context of the page, the design, and how, what users were coming for. Because it wasn't set up as a holistic plan, without any awareness of context, it was going to come out ugly no matter what their intent was. And this is a good lesson to bring to future design. The site that delivers an ad cannot be separated from that ad without users being annoyed. Unfortunately, though pop-ups are long gone, interstitials are still in regular use. Those are the ads that pop up on a page but block the content until you go past them. Um, even without the separate window, you'll find people are equally annoyed by this behavior. Um, Forbes is particularly famous, especially because it gave you malware for a month. And these types have been named by Motherboard confirm shaming, which is they shame you into giving you their email. We'll get into why that's around later, but it's basically because of um, lead generation. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It became pretty clear that we needed an alternative because it turned out that as much as businesses were promising that that was the way users wanted to add and that that was the method of monetizing the web for the future, it was not. In the wake of the dot-com bust, there was an opening for anyone who was still standing to reinvent advertising technology. If publishers had stepped in then, we might be living in a far different world. But instead, a fairly new company called Google invented a new type of ad, one that was far more targeted against who users were, answering that vital marketer question of who is, my, who is seeing my ad. That is the search text ad. Still in place today and still fairly successful. Why is that? Well, because display ads like the banner ad aren't in line with how the web works. They aren't in line with how most web pages look. They don't fit the design. Text ads do. Why did the banner ad come about in the first place then? Well, it turned out that it was invented for a website that looked a lot different from our modern website. It was invented for this site, Hotwired, now a travel site, but once something entirely different. Um, and the user imperative and integration worked so well with this experience because it was designed for this experience. A mostly visual, mostly graphic setup for a site that was not text dominated. So what is a Google search ad that it is so successful? It's not much. It's got 1 to 30 characters in a headline, 2 to 30 characters in a subheadline. As you can see, I tried to fit the entirety of the name of this workshop into a Google ad for this, and it did not fit. Um, the description is 80 characters, and Google recommends that you have a clear call to action, at least one keyword, capitalize the first letter, and include specific prices or promotions if you're trying to sell something. The search ad is successful in part because it knows you and it knows who it is targeting. The creator of this successful, if small, campaign hits it on the nose. When the search ad is most successful is when it finds us at the moments when our defenses are down, when we are at our most vulnerable. This is the secret of the Google Display ad. So, the nice thing about an ad only being a 60 character headline is it can all fit in a tweet. So I would love it if you could think about what would a search ad look like if you were going to use it to promote yourself? What would you be targeting? 
What would you be thinking about? How would you be talking about yourself? Give me, at most, 60 characters, put in a tweet, give me a hashtag for this event, as well as a hashtag with the tags that have to do with how you promote yourself. Um, it would be great if we could have at least a few people talk about it, because I'd love to have some examples to talk about. But if not, we can always move forward. So give it a try, and uh, I will give you about 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more. If anyone has any questions or suggestions, what I'm going to do is step back to Google's recommendations for how to make a successful search ad. Can you tell us what he had, what was in his ad, or what sort of the Brownstein guy, the, the next slide? Oh, um, sure. Just saying, hire me, that's what he's saying. Yeah, so uh, basically what he said is he went to and bought ads that were targeted against the names of the people who he wanted to hire him. So whenever they searched for themselves, um, his ad would pop up, and it would say, Googling yourself is a lot of fun, so is hiring me. And then it gave his name and a link to his website. Um, and he did eventually get hired by one of those people who he <laughs> sold an ad for. Trying to write a 60 character search ad for yourself. What would you put in front of the people who you next want to hire you?
Okay, this is a three minute warning. Try and tweet out some of those ads for me. If you feel, if you're feeling creative, you can tweet out more than one. I don't mind. Okay. Alternatively, if you would like to create an ad but would not want to tweet it, you can send it to me as a comment and I can talk about it in that context as well. Um, use the URL up there, it'll send it to me on the screen. Yeah, at least one hashtag that's a topic that you're going to be targeting. And uh, the hashtag doesn't need to be included in the 60 characters, to be clear. Yes. 60, 60 characters of ad broken by design as the hashtag, so I see it. And then one hashtag to indicate what topic you're targeting with this ad. Just post it if you use the Google thing to post it where it says ask a question. Yep, post it where it says ask a question. <laughs> Created you on also so that here. 
No, no, if you've tweeted it, I can see it on Twitter. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about what we've got here. So, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, you got a bunch of them. So does anyone mind if I show their names along with their thing? No, okay, cool. So let's look at the ones that came in through here first. So we could see some commonalities right away that come out of the necessity of the shortness of the ad. You have to be very direct. You have to be straight to the point. There's no mysterious graphic. There's no preview. Everybody who wants to get hired by a Google ad has to say right away, hire me. Don't let this one get away is a good one. Uh, very descriptive. Cheating with hashtags. Cheating with hashtags. I'm not sure that counts quite so much. Somebody's going to see that ad and not, they're going to be searching for cybersecurity, but they are not going to know why to hire this person or who that person is. Um, on Twitter, Where'd the mouse go? There it is. On Twitter, we have a couple that came in here. This one's mine. I managed to fit it in. You can see it, I'm sure. The new school's branding person would be very upset that I left out the the, but thumbs the brakes when you got 60 characters. Um, and you can see I used some shortenings there. Um, you had someone who's got a sense of humor. Um, maybe this is off remote. Yeah, I don't think this person's in the room. No. Okay, so, yeah. You know, sometimes that's a good way to catch the eye. The idea here is succinct, on topic, and very direct. Lessons that most of the display ads you see on a modern website still are not really doing. Okay. So, we've looked at the search ads. Lots of people were making them. And, but there are million, there are billions and billions of searches. And when, what happens when somebody's searching for something and an advertiser has not thought to go against it? You all picked very direct keywords about what it is you're interested in. But if you were trying to get someone to hire you as a designer, and they are searching for Photoshop tips, and your tag was design, your ad's not going to get seen. So there needed to be another factor to deal with the people who wanted to reach you, even when they didn't know how they wanted to reach you. Targeting based on audience. This is the Google AdWords screen right here. Here, it's becoming more based on your behavior, not just in the moment, but overall. So now, when you search for design, that's saved in your Google account. And when you go to search for Adobe, it'll pop up. Or Google will do a whole bunch of crawling and decide that people who search for Adobe also want design and associate with it that way. All of a sudden, getting you at those secret vulnerable moments became easier for marketers overall and less transparent to you as users. Did it work? You bet. Google. Still a pretty profitable company from what I hear. But sites are constantly, if slowly, training their users to look less and less at ads. No good thing lasts forever, and so an alternative has to be created as the ad types that are successful in the context that they are successful start becoming ignored. What was the result? Lots more ad types all over the place. Between 2011 and now, the IAB, which is the organization that is the official industry group for digital advertising, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, has launched dozens of new ad types. Here is just a sample from one year. They launched one, two, three, four, five, six different ad types just in that year. We're constantly rotating in and kicking out new ad types. It's its own desperation. What can we get away with, and, but how can we change these ads enough to keep attracting users' eyes? So let's look at some of the alternatives that people came up with. Pre-roll, 
which is one of the video that you see before the video you actually want to see, is a solution that's become very popular lately. Um, it makes a lot of money. Advertisers really like it because they think it puts that ad right in front of you and you can't ignore it. I mostly ignore it. <laughs> I'm not ad blocking it. So uh, can anyone guess who invented the underlying technology that powers pre-roll ads today? Nope. <laughs> the Onion, America's finest news source. The functionality that powers our pre-roll ads today came from an approach that didn't have any interest in aligning with related content or journalistic ethics. They were an admittedly great joke newspaper, but none of how we see video ads on the web today was designed with the needs, interests, or reality of how news organizations care about their video. Another situation where the technology was designed without purpose or intent, unplanned after effects all over the place. Next up, branded content. The advertorial isn't exactly a new invention. The modern version of it, though, was created on a website called True Slant, and it came out of a very good idea. I'm going to quote a 2010 Ad Age article. Though through Ad Slant, which was the branded content version of True Slant, marketers get a page, the same social tools, the same distribution as journalists, and the ability to have their content placed alongside the news and opinion content. Richard Edelman, CEO of Edelman, um, said, it's a different kind of advertorial. Your paying, paying corporate users can have as many as 40 authors contributing to their version of the site. The opportunity for us in PR to work both in the free and paid slides of True Slant is enormous. The advertorial can be the company's view on a set of issues updated in real time. The reader's community participation is then enhanced with links and cross-references to bloggers and journalists in the mainstream media. If this is sounding at all familiar to you, you might be able to guess who would eventually buy True Slant. Do we have any guesses? It's Forbes. They acquired True Slant. They acquired True Slant's approach, and it turned them into web kingpin for a while, until it didn't. These days, when most people think about Forbes, they don't think of a quality news publication. Also, they had to sell their New York office and move to New Jersey, if I can't think of a better indication of a failing news organization. <laughs> Yes, branded content didn't only have problems on Forbes. The problem is that when you build content for brands that uses the same tools of journalists, if you don't think about how journalists automatically build in their ethical checks and their editorial considerations, um, then those won't be incorporated in those tools. There was more than one mismatch in the world early days of branded content, but none was more high profile than the Atlantic's now infamous ad for the Church of Scientology. The system that created this ad was riddled with problems because no one had put much planning into how this advertorial would fit the overall system and product that was Atlantic.com. Needless to say, they pulled the ad, and it was such an awful result that few other than Forbes would try that ha their hand at branded content for a few years afterwards. But it's back now, some different formats, and we can talk about those later. All those publications out there, all those advertising options, you'd think that the money would be flowing everywhere, a huge marketplace in which publications and news organizations are prospering on the web. But it isn't. They're working on behalf of a mere portion of the marketplace. That's less than 50% of all digital ads are going to anyone other than Facebook and Google. Um, and it's shrinking. Why is this? Well. It has to do with you, or more specifically, your data. Your search history, not enough. What you're looking at right now, not enough. They want to know who you are all the time and have that data follow you around. And nowhere is that data given, to, given more freely by you to advertisers than Google and Facebook. And this gets into one of the most essential parts of the current digital ad ecosystem, the difference between what's called first-party data and third-party data. Now, this is why Facebook and Google get such a huge percentage of the marketplace. 
they have first party data because you have told them what you're interested in, what you're doing, where you are, what type of things you search for, what your friends are interested in. They can answer all the questions that those marketers have about who is going to see their ad, when, when they're going to see the ad, why they're going to see the ad, where they're going to see the ad, with much more accuracy. Whereas most publications rely on a combination of their own first party data and third party data. That's data that's collected through partnerships with other publications, collected through partnerships with companies like Crux or Blue Kai. These companies cookie you as you arrive on sites throughout the web, and they store the information about where you're visiting, what you're visiting, what the topics are. And because they stand aside from the publications, they can have that information follow you from multiple publications. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you might look at it, whether or not you're a business executive or a user, um, that tends to not be quite so accurate as that first party data that you are actually giving to Google. And as a result, these ads are considered to be less profitable, less useful. Google and Facebook's advantage is therefore huge. They're incredibly strong advertising in ways that publications simply don't have available to them. So, we're going to take a brief look. This is a good time to have those laptops out. What do Facebook and Google know about you? So, you may not realize it, but you can download the entirety of your Facebook data. It is a lot of data. I would not encourage you to do it this very moment. You'll have the link to this presentation to get to this later. But I do encourage you to take a look at it, especially because unlike most of the places where you can download your data, Facebook actually sets it up as a website. You download your data, you open it up on a computer, and you go to a homepage that lets you go through everything that Google has on you at this moment. You can also see how Facebook targets ads at you. This is how, this is my ad preferences on Facebook. Sort of a uh, different type of name than you might expect. Preferences might indicate that I have indicated a preference for something, but this is Facebook's information that it has collected automatically. Um, it is mostly correct, though I must say I'm not a huge fan of drama movies. I'm not sure why that's on there. But, um, nor of League of Legends that much, but this is what's decided. You can go to this page and see pages and pages of all of the things that Google is telling advertisers that you're interested in. Oh, sorry, that's Facebook, yes. That Facebook will say you're interested in. Um... After you've checked that out, download your Google data in the same way you can as Facebook. It's not quite as accessible, but I do highly encourage you checking it out. Um, and then you can start taking a look at all of the places that Google thinks you've been. This is the Google location history. If you use your phone and you use Google location services and you turn on your GPS and sometimes even when you don't turn on your GPS, Google is keeping track of where you are and where you've been. This is the map of locations that Google thinks I've been for the last year. Now, this seems pretty innocuous. You might think, okay, so Google knows everything about where I've been going. Maybe that'll be useful if I ever need to find my way back. But it can have some consequences. Um, the first year I moved back to New York, I worked for a company called CFO Magazine. Um, every time I'd go there, I'd have my phone out reading, as one does. And of course, Google recorded my trips. Now, if I go back to my Google location history for that period, Google made a little bit of a mistake. See, for whatever reason, it decided I wasn't at CFO's offices. It decided I was at the offices of a rent attorney. Um, and I kept going to the offices of a rent attorney for years, according to Google. Also seems fairly innocuous, except it turns out that the latest generation of background checking services, look at your Google history. So, now I have a problem. The next time I apply for rent someplace, some company is going to look at me and say, gee, that person sure has a proclivity for visiting rent attorneys. That might get me in some trouble. Here's some other information Google can take a look at. Just a quick clarify. When you're saying they're looking at that, are they looking at that because you authorized that, or they can do that through some other... Well, they don't have to, so the, the companies that are doing background checks that are using social media and Google data are not having any authorization from me personally. Um, that information's on Google and Google sells it to advertisers. 
All they have to do is register themselves as if they were an advertiser or go through some other data exchange program that Google might have. And they can find out you specifically for your, for your background, all the places you've been. Yeah, um, I mean, not all of the places. There's a lot of data in there. But yeah, people use that type of information. There's a New York Times article on this recently which noted that law enforcement officials have been going to Google, trying to get this data and pulling down information. Um, and then perhaps some more salacious episodes, private investigators have been getting this data for, to use it to track down people um, and draw conclusions that may or may not be accurate. Um, so you can see all of the services you have authorized yourself to use on Google. Um, if you're like me, you're, you'd be a heavy Google user of a lot of different services, but even with the awareness that I have, when I checked this most recent time, there were a whole bunch of Google services that I had never even heard of on that list. I highly encourage you to take a look right now, check it out. Um, the other thing you could take a look at is finding out what Google thinks you're interested in. Is that this link? I'm sorry, it's a little long. And this is mine right here. Um, this one, perhaps a little bit more accurate than Facebook even. It has indeed guessed the range of my age, my gender, this one knows what movies I like better than Facebook does. Um, not a big fan of football, not sure why that's on there. I do like blues though. I guess we all have to know a little bit about banking, so that's on there too. Um, it's got computer and video games and comic books. Those are definitely accurate. Um, not just sure about autos and vehicles. I don't own a car. I haven't owned a car in a long time. But uh, I do keep getting ads for car-related stuff, so I guess that's where this is coming from. Now, Google and Facebook both collect this data, and I encourage you to take a look at what you've got when you're logged in. But they'll collect it on you whether or not you're logged in. Using an idea called device fingerprinting, various services will attempt to discover where you've been and where you are, even if you're not logged in, even if you're without cookies. Your device has certain characteristics that they try and use to track you. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, additionally, a lot of this information can get stored by these services and things called shadow profiles, which are essentially profiles that look very much like this, but that are built based off of logged out data. And that information gets collected from more places than you think. Every place you've seen a Twitter button, Twitter is collecting your user data. Every place you've seen a Facebook share button, Facebook's collecting your user data. And if you're not logged into Facebook, Facebook's still collecting it. All that means is now you can't see what it is. What can you do? And Google is not the only one collecting data on you. This is one particularly alarming example, I suppose. This is an article from The Guardian from 2017. Um, under the new EU data laws that were coming into place at the time, this particular person asked Tinder, the dating app, for all of the information that Tinder had collected on them. Tinder was kind enough to print this all out and mail it to them. It was 800 pages. Fascinating. Uh, I'd like to take a moment. Does, any, does anyone see anything that they particularly were surprised by in either their Google profile or their Facebook profile? That is odd, unless you're about to get married. Okay. <laughs> it, yeah, like it assigns companies, right? Like it's like Target. Oh, it said you're interested in Target or Facebook or Google? Google. Google said, I, I have not seen that one, but it said you're interested in Target. It's, well, no, it's saying this advertiser shows you ads based on information you gave to the advertiser, which the advertiser provided to Google. So it's like, I bought something at Target and now... Yep. Gives. Google, Target has sent that data to Google. Uh, what happens outside, this is a great example of this, what happens outside even the real-time status of the web is a lot of companies will buy and sell your data from each other. We'll get into sort of the mechanics of this a little bit later, but essentially you could be doing a whole bunch of stuff on one site and that's completely unconnected from Google and then Google could buy all your data or Facebook could buy all your data or some other company could buy all your data from that particular site. Um, there in fact have been a couple of instances where companies have been acquired purely for their database of user information. 
Anyone else see something that was particularly surprising to them? I have tons of, on Facebook, tons of um, advertisers I've interacted with that are car dealerships in places like Virginia. Interesting. And I have no idea if you have. Are you a frequent visitor of Virginia? No. Uh, I've never owned a car. I've never shopped for a car. Hmm. Might be a good time to change your Facebook password. Yeah, maybe. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's real weird. Anyone else? Well, I, I quit Facebook a while ago, and um, I don't really use it anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys have used Facebook at all. I it must. They certainly don't have to throw it out, or at least they didn't until very recently, and then only if you live in the EU. Um, we'll talk about GDPR in a little bit, but that's a whole other factor in all of this. Does this would this incorporate also videos you've watched on YouTube? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's why the reasons why Google has all of these properties that seem to be serving very different needs. They all collect user data information about you to make you more precisely targeted. Of course, it doesn't always work out. For whatever reason, Hulu has decided that I speak Spanish, and so I get a lot of Spanish language ads. I do not speak Spanish. I've taken three different language classes in my life, and none of them were Spanish. They probably should have been, but they were not. Yeah, actually, thinking back on what Facebook thought I was, um, I'm not black, but it thought that I was African-American. Yeah. This is actually one of the things that have caused some pretty nasty consequences where Google has misidentified people as particular um, races that they consider to be less likely to buy things or as particular monetary uh, classes that they think are less likely to afford things and essentially, basically almost by accident, duplicated the practice of redlining. So certain opportunities that might be shown to someone that Google believes is in the uh, bracket of making 100K might not be shown because Google has decided, and this is a real situation, Google has decided some people who are wealthy individuals but happen to be African American, therefore their system has averaged out that African Americans are not wealthy individuals and is not showing them opportunities that could make differences for their careers. In fact, might be showing them even different search results because of that. This is one of the problems that comes out of this sort of vast information collection. It can be wrong, and that wrongness can have consequences that even Google does not anticipate. Did anyone have anything else they wanted to share before we moved on? Nope? Okay. Yep, they're all collecting data about you and building profiles. Yeah, for, oh, for seeing it? No. <laughs> Most of these platforms do not, but increasingly they will have to, uh, at least if you live in Europe, um, because GDPR requires data portability, which means you have to be able to go to a company and say, give me all of the data you have about me, and you have to be able to say, also delete all that data, and they have to be able to comply, and if they don't, they can be fined a whole lot of money. Um, this is all sort of just coming around. Now, because this targeting is so successful on Facebook and Google, it's become the business model for our entire internet, okay? Now, you asked if there are some other companies that are collecting this type of information. The answer is there are a lot of companies that are collecting this type of information. This is 2011. Under 200 companies, the first time someone put together a list of ad tech vendors. It's about 150 products on here. In 2012, there became 350 companies, all involved in the business of sending an ad to your web page. In 2014, it became 1,000. In 2015, 3,500. In 2016, uh, this is supposed to be updated, but it should be 5,000. And in 2017, it became over 5,000. There are now over, no, this one should be, 7,000, I apologize. It should be about 7,000. There are 7,000 individual products out there right now involved in trying to put an ad in front of your face. 
That's a lot of them. And they are all collecting data about you. And most of them are not even as functional as Facebook or Google are. Ah, there's the right slide. 7,000. Um, so this is how many companies sit between the ad you see on a web page that you don't have your ad blocker on and the advertiser who actually wanted you to see that ad. So it's 2018. There are almost 7,000 products involved in the process of putting an ad in front of you. What are all of these companies doing? Well, mostly being leeches and pulling money out of the ecosystem. In an experiment last year, The Guardian attempted to buy an ad on their own website. Of the 100% of the money that they put in, 70% of it disappeared into the vast advertising technology ecosystem, leaving them with only getting 30 cents on every dollar that they put in to buy an ad on their own site. This article from Digiday by an anonymous ad tech professional notes that basically agencies and these ad tech companies are just pulling money off of the table between where the ad gets sold to, that being a publisher, and the person who's actually paying the money, that being the advertiser. Now, in those 7,000 companies, there are all these different organizations just interested in trying to pull that information out. And agencies take a cut, each metrics provider takes a cut. They are just trying to figure out these four things. How do I deliver an ad? Who should get that ad? Did they get the ad? And did they see the ad? Now, when you load an ad on a publisher web page, there are going to be at least three, probably more like 12 different vendors trying to answer each of these questions. So when you get that ad, you're going to end up with 24, 40 different companies getting your information, trying to guess whether or not you're the right place, the right person. It'll be a real mess. It'll be slow, it'll be inaccurate, and unfortunately, it won't be very profitable for the publisher whose ad that site is appearing on. And then, of course, there are ad blockers. So even once all of those different companies get involved, huge ads still might be blocked, and it still might not ever be seen. Now, some companies have taken to a rather creative way of dealing with the ad blocker, which is that they are paying them. Um, if you use the uh, ad blocker with that graphic, the stop hand, Google is paying them to show ads from the Google Ad Exchange in exchange for promising that they are safe and not annoying. I don't find the Google Exchange ads to be any less or more annoying than ads from anywhere else. I don't know about you. Now, not only that, but with the process of ad blocking, now there are all of these companies on that list of 7,000 they're trying to get you to unblock the ad. They're trying to put a wall in front of you asking you to unblock the ad. They want to make sure that your ad is viewable. On the other side of this, you have consumers who are using tools like Adblocker or Ghostery or Brave to try and make sure that they never have to see an annoying ad again. What's the result? Welcome to the ad tech arms race. This is why the uh, advertising technology industry has had over a 4,000% growth in the number of products between 2011 and today. Every day, every month, new back and forths come, new ways to try and track you, new ways to try and block that tracking. It's put our companies, our news organizations, at war with the people we're supposed to be trying to serve, our users, on behalf of an ever-growing group of advertising technology companies that don't really have any interest in properly serving you the ad and properly maintaining journalism. They're just there to take that money off the table. And all this disintermediation, all this lack of transparency between the advertiser and the person seeing the ad and the publisher has had some serious consequences. Because we don't know anymore how ads get onto the page, most times you see them, who is providing the ad, when they're being provided, what it's linking to, what their goal is, we end up with a situation like we had in 2016. All of these ads coming from people who did not have your best interests at heart, did not have the publication's best interests at heart, did not have Facebook's interests at heart, 
And they were very difficult to deal with. Uh, because the system lacks transparency. It lacks a clear connection between the advertiser and the publisher. So, it's very difficult to create a Google ad without setting up an account, but for those of you who do have a Facebook ad account, this is a good opportunity to understand a little bit about how Facebook targets you. And we're going to do that by creating a Facebook ad. A real Facebook ad, you're not just gonna tweet it at me. Um, this is the URL to go to, facebook.com ads manager slash creation. I apologize for the person who has deleted Facebook. Um, this will probably not be available to you. However, um, I'm going to pull it up on the screen so people can take a look. The goal here is just to walk through the system and walk through the process of setting up a Facebook ad. It should give you the option right away and you'll be able to see a lot of different targeting and information about how Google tries to understand you as a person. So let's all take a look. I'm going to mirror, and I encourage you to go to this site on your own and uh, try it out. Do, 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 do. Uh. I have a lot of windows. Oops, nope, that's not the right way to get that. All right, actually, that's right. I actually have this filmed for us. So you can follow along with me here. There we go. So this is me going through the process of building a Facebook ad. You can see these ads can be targeted at the website, at the app. You can even set up ads to vend through Messenger. You can see there's all sorts of geolocated ideas. You can create you can target people who live in a location, who recently were in a location, who are traveling to a location. Um, you can add a whole bunch of locations. You can do age targeting, gender targeting. Here I'm targeting it to New York. Oop, that URL is at Facebook. So if you just go to Facebook.com and you hit the down arrow on the right, you'll get to uh, Facebook ads, create an ad. And then you can go to create and manage to ad manager. That's this thing here. Have you found it? It's Facebook.com slash ads manager. That's ads with an S. So A D S M A N A G E R. Did you start with a create new campaign? Yes. Um, but, yeah. So there's quick creation and then we've got some more. Yes, but you can go through this process as it is. Yeah, without the quick creation. And you'll see all of the potential options. Facebook will try and fill in a lot of these fields for you um, if you go through the quick creation time, but then you don't get to see all of the different ways you can target people. Um, this is another situation where we've had a real problem where people have been redlined, communities have been locked out. Um, there's actually a lawsuit going on right now because it turns out a number of Silicon Valley companies were advertising their jobs just to men, which is against the law. Um, there was real estate stuff too. Real estate yeah, stuff too. Yeah. It's not surprising, but yeah. Another situation where communities were essentially being redlined no matter where they were on the internet. So give it a try. I'm going to give you about um, five minutes to sort of walk through it and see if, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll come to you and help. And if you're curious and we'll talk about anything, just ask me and we'll talk about it in a little bit. I'm going to get some more water.
Uh, so I'm accepting questions on the audience tool. So if you have anything that you would like to um, ask anonymously, feel free to do so. Or if you're on the stream, I guess. I mean, I'm sure it's more than one. Yeah, yeah, Was it a recent thing? In the last couple years. Oh, I'm not sure then. Okay. I could probably find it, but I don't know off the top of my head. But yeah, this thing, sort of thing happens all the time. Essentially, you're building out huge groups of user data, and then you can sell it to other people. There are companies called DMPs, which are data management providers. And DMP is essentially the whole business model is. They collect information on people, they store it, and they resell it to others, um, usually for the process of targeting advertisements. Yeah, well, so a little bit about why I am in the job I am in right now. Um, before I worked for the Washington Post, I worked for Salon.com. Um, and when I worked for Salon.com, I had a lot of problems with advertisements, and I wrote about them pretty frequently. Um, it ended up getting republished by a journalism outlet, and um, what happened was the person who led the unit at the time, his name is Jared Dicker, you can find him on Twitter, he's great. Um, he uh, basically reached out to me and said, all of the problems that you're seeing with modern ad tech, you know, we can't necessarily beat them and just right now, but there's a unit at the Washington Post called the Red Team, which is the team that I'm on. Why don't you come and join us and we can blow it all up. Um, and that's what I do at the Washington Post. I build out new advertising technology and new advertising methodologies that are aligned with the publisher. Um, the idea being that all of this ad tech we're looking at is coming out of a place that is not publisher focused. These companies don't care about journalism or ethics. But when we start building this stuff from the publisher perspective, we start building in our rules and our requirements. Now, of course, you go to the Washington Post, you'll still see programmatic ads right now. Um, and those types of systems will exist for a while, I'm sure. But there are ways you can do them with better rules and ways you can do them with worse rules. So our first step is to do them with better rules, to be more aware of how they work, to be more active in making our site safe for users for when an, an occasional bad ad might slip through, and then looking at ways that we can monetize the site Still with ads, though the Washington Post does have a very healthy subscription um, group, but still with ads that don't require the same type of operations, in which user data is not something that we have to give away. You can still potentially target on it without leaking it. Um, there's ways that we can do it so that we don't have to involve hundreds of vendors, that will, which have to be reliable. There's ways we can be more compliant with what users need when they request their data and when they have an interest in it. And of course, we can build out these tools to be more ethical about how we track people and their awareness of it. And then part of what I do on my team is I take those conclusions, those things that we build, and I'm bringing them to the ARC platform, which is a content management system built by the Washington Post that we are selling to other publishers. And so when we build good ethical ad technology for us, and we get it working, and we know that it works, and it complies with what our requirements are, we can then sell it along to other publishers. So yeah, being ethical in the world of ad tech is a very difficult proposition, but there's ways you can do better and there's ways you can do worse. And I'm trying to do better. <laughs> can you, can you, it's really interesting. Can you guys 
specific example of like something you kind of did? Uh, without getting to sure. Um, I actually have a bit at the end about the new technology that we're working on, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But a good example of that might be something like Post Pulse, which is an ad unit we sell, where we sell it directly to advertisers, so it's not programmatic. Um, and what we find is that uh, we have our ads user tested. The watch it goes to the user lab at CC office. So when we develop a new ad type, we bring it to there, we get a group of watch it goes people to look at it. And Talk to us about it. And what we discovered is that users actually like ads more that help them read the Washington Post better. And so it's an ad unit that essentially has a publisher, has an advertiser suggesting Washington Post content to you, along with a clearly indicated piece of their own content as well. Um, and it turns out that our readers like that, and it turns out that advertisers like that. So that's a good example of an ad type. Um, at, towards the end, we'll talk about that technology that we're working on adopting. So I am going to uh, stop you if you're still working on Facebook ads. Did anyone have anything interesting that they saw in the Facebook ad that they'd like to talk about as they were building it? Um, particular targeting options that surprised them or anything like that? They cut some out, right? Hmm? They yes, they have recently cut some of the options out because of the legal troubles. Going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on. Keep in mind, there are people whose entire job it is is to make those Facebook ads. So they get very expert in that and very expert in targeting you. Always good to know. So, is this the point that we are at now? Is it just going to be advertising versus democracy? And how can journalism sustain itself in that situation? There's a lot of problems that are coming out of these systems. This is a from a report by that uh, UX firm that we looked at the eye tracking stuff for, which notes the arrival of bad branded content. Content that looks like it is part of editorial content is not clearly indicated, and because of that is very successful. Now, if we want to think about how to build good ads, that are successful, we should think about what makes a bad ad successful. So, how do we design products to defraud people and get them to click on our content in a bad way? Now, how did these options come about? Well, publishers had pushed ads to the side. The ads are out of the main frame, they're out of the content, and so they're out there without supervision. They thought that that was enough to separate out that user experience. But unethical and unthinking advertisers are working their way back into the context. And their main tool is to trick readers and users into thinking that they are interacting with real journalism. This is the thing. There's this, all this conversation about trust in journalism and readership of news publications. But these techniques would not work if readers did not trust the news format. So, but they are still being fooled. So, let's talk about the first example. This is video fraud. This was a recent New York Times investigation. There were a whole bunch of follow-ups that came after this. Um, this was basically a whole bunch of video ads that were popping up in front of YouTube ads and a whole bunch of YouTube videos that were popping up after other YouTube videos that were not what you would expect. The most the worst instance of this was with child's videos. YouTube at that point had a product called YouTube Kids, which played kids' videos, or what Google's algorithms had decided were kids' videos. And what happens when you only have an algorithm instead of an editor deciding what content is what is it becomes very easy to sneak in and trick these things. People were creating videos with bright colors and kid-friendly names, and then they were just setting AIs to randomly generate weird video content. And when an algorithm is deciding what the content should look like, and an algorithm is deciding what the content should make, and it's getting aimed at kids, shit gets bad fast. Um, there were some very nasty videos, some involving uh, mm -hmm. pregnant characters getting killed that were cartoon characters, some alarming ones involving pig children's character whose name I am blanking on all of a sudden. 
Yes, Pepper Pig. Um, getting buried alive, as I recall. Um, and not only were these ads getting monetized automatically by YouTube's system, and not only were they out there, but YouTube systems were automatically recommending them to kids after them watching something else. And kids, being children, would just let the recommendation continue looping. And they were a hugely valuable audience for these fraudsters because kids don't skip ads. They can't tell the difference and they don't care. Uh, so this is how you end up with a bad system that was not planned, making a lot of money for a number of unscrupulous people. One of the people involved in making these uh, fake and alarming kids videos is now arrested and his kids were taken away by child custody services. So don't do that. Um, the, because of the videos he was making. This person was making videos where he was shaving his children's faces for some reason. Stuff like that. Not great. Okay, delivery scams. Believe it or not, even though more and more advertisers are pulling out of the type of alt-right sites that were found very alarmingly during 2016, these sites continue to exist. What's the reason? Well, they're not making their money with ads, they're making their money with delivery scams. Not too far from QVC, but targeted at their particular audience, which they know so well through user data. You go to Breitbart and you sign up for a Breitbart newsletter, or you go to InfoWars and you sign up for the InfoWars newsletter, they're going to sell you some wonderful male vitality supplements. Now, what those are, no one knows. Um, I encourage you to read this excellent article by Charlie Warzel on BuzzFeed, the link will be in the presentation, where he took some of these products to get tested. Um, the answer is they're not much, but they're making a lot of money for Alex Jones. Um, now we get to content fraud. This is unbranded content content fraud, and it takes two forms. One of the forms is people creating fake content to place in legitimate sites. This particular example is one where this group of writers and marketers created a fake person who went on to write a bunch of fake articles that had a bunch of very real links to products that they got paid when you clicked through on them. Um, they were able to get this, this, excuse me, this person's fake articles onto legitimate or semi-legitimate sites. Um, I say semi-legitimate, I don't know how you feel about XOG, but that was one of them. Um, and they were very successful until they were eventually discovered by Jezebel. Um, the other type of example are people who are creating their own networks of fake content. This is an example of a person who created a network of fake political news sites. Um, he was discovered by NPR, and uh, basically all this is about is he's creating articles that rev you up and get you upset so that you click on them, from your Facebook account or your Twitter account or wherever you please, and then you load onto that page and you get ads. And he gets money off of those ads. According to him, he was making uh, the equivalent of 70K a year um, just on ads on his fake news site. Um, neither of these examples are political. This person was doing stuff for both sides. This is purely money motive. This is also the best. The Macedonians were doing the same thing, yeah, because it made them a lot of money. Of course, there is the political aspect, which we saw a lot of in the aftermath of the election. This is a sample of fake political ads that Congress released after getting them from Facebook. Um, what you can see here is they are targeted at both sides, and this is essentially just about getting people where they are and hitting them with the right message, even if they don't realize it. And remember when we talked about the Google search ad that the person created, it's about hitting you at that point where you are vulnerable. And that's what's going on here. And now, there are also chum boxes. You've probably seen these at the bottom of sites. What is going on with these, you might think? It's confusing. Why would legitimate publications put them on the bottom of their sites? Why would anyone put their stuff into there? And every once in a while, you'll even see, like you see here, legitimate news sites that are putting their, inf their stuff into these as well. These represent the uh, purest version of a play called arbitrage. Arbitrage is a situation in which you are trying to buy traffic for a certain price 
and then sell ads on the traffic that arrives for a higher price. In this situation, the more reputable of these networks, which is Taboola, um, you can buy ad traffic. You can buy traffic through these for about 14 cents. If you make 15 cents on the person who lands on your page, that's one cent profit. If you can do it a thousand times, you're starting to make a little money. If you can do it a million times, you're going to make a decent amount of money. If you can do it a million times for a thousand different posts, you are suddenly rolling in the money. Now, these types of situations are created because. The ad tech was designed without any consideration as to how users would react to it, how the network would work with it, what it meant to buy ads, or any sort of controls over what shows up. In the nastier versions of these arbitrage scans, they aren't even being populated by people, they're being populated by bots. You can go to some of these sites, and I encourage you to do so, though in an incognito window and a secure computer, Preferably not a PC, which could be more dangerous, but if you are one, then install antivirus software on it. I'm not saying Macs are the most amazing thing in the world, just it's a lot harder to get a virus on them. Um, not impossible, but harder. And uh, you might see on some of these sites that there are legitimate news organizations like the Wall Street Journal that have their ads showing up on oh, boardlion.com. What's going on there? Well, what's happening is bots are essentially going through this system, clicking on a ton of different things, and the, uh, the fake news site is buying ads on legitimate news sites. The bot is clicking through those sites, and then it'll come back to the originator site. And because the bot has just spent all day clicking through these news sites, it's acquired a whole bunch of user data that is now attached to it. So it looks like a very interested news consumer, and when it arrives back on BoardLion.com, suddenly it's the highest value reader out there. And so now they're going to cause BoardLion.com to get those high value ads, because they're getting all of these apparently high value consumers. But how else are that? Are you, so you're saying that the bots are accumulating cookie? Cookie data, data. yep. That is Valued by the by the Chumbox service, yeah. Um, so it lets these Chumbox sites make a whole lot of money without even worrying about gang users. They can just fake the users. Um, now it's worth noting that arbitrage is the legitimate monetization strategy for real news websites as well. Chances are most of the news websites you visit every day have spent some of their budget buying traffic in one form or another. It might be on Facebook, it might be on Twitter, it might be in these chum boxes. Now, what this comes out of is they look for the place where they can make that difference in money, and they buy that traffic, and they rely on these companies to be operating at the same ethical state that they are. But they don't. A lot of the traffic they buy might be bots, and when it's not bots, sometimes it can be even worse. Some of these networks are infamous for funneling users through a process called click-unders, which is when they are opening websites underneath your browser as you're browsing in order to make it look like you're really browsing, but you don't even see what you're doing. This is a problem that actually happens. Here, too, we have a product that is designed without the intent of what a news organization does, or what it should look like, or how it should operate on the web. But it's what we got, because we didn't build anything else. Has this been the for, for web apps that have ever tried to come down? It's like, it's the same body that sort of standardizes the dynamics and stuff that they ever said. The IAB? Uh, well, no, because all of these companies are also members of the IAB. Kabula, <laughs> Outbrain, probably Rev Content, I don't know. But the IAB's membership is composed of a lot of ad tech companies, and they don't have a lot of incentive for the ad to be regulated. There's a whole bunch of interesting ways that are happening around trying to secure these ads. That's a whole different conversation. Um, for the most part, they are hampered by the fact that they are being built and operated by the same companies that caused the problems. And this is my favorite type. I promised we'd talk about lead gen. This is a lead churn content fraud play. 
Now, what is happening here, and uh, I have a very long Twitter thread linked in here where I've traced this ad for a very long time, is um, they don't really care about what happens um, in terms of showing you ads when they arrive on the site. What they do is, and you have probably seen this ad if your, I guess, web profile is anything like mine or some variant of it, is they give you the name of a company that they operate, they send you to this site, which you see in the background there, Everquote, and they ask you for a bunch of information so that they can make a nice, useful recommendation for you. Um, in this case, all they really did is they just sent me onto progressive.com with some of my information in there. Um, what they were actually doing was collecting my personal information, if I had put in my real personal information, and storing it. And then they take that stored personal information and they sell it. And they keep selling it. Because once they've sold it the first time, they don't delete it. They can just sell it to whoever they please as many times as they want. Um, and there are whole swaths of companies out there doing this. This one just happens to be very high profile. Nope, no regulations that address that, um, except in the EU where they're starting to build out data collection regulations. But even there, if you're, they want to bring you in for a recommendation, and if you wanted to get a recommendation, you'd consent to have your information collected um, and probably consent to the terms which include reselling your information. Uh, they're supposed to put up a warning, but who knows? People don't always read them. I don't know if you've read the terms of service for your iPod or iTunes, but... They are equally as complicated in GDPR land, unfortunately. So I want to give you a map into how you can look into these systems and how they work so that you can do it on your own. I want to take a little deeper look at how these ads work. So I am going to pull up a window here. And I'm going to turn around because it's easier to blow it up on this side and take a look at how we can look at ads here. So we're going to go to google.com. Um, that's not like platform. OK, so let's pick a news site, um, not the Washington Post, because I can't talk to you about the Washington Post business practices, but some other news site. Um, does anyone have a suggestion? Time.com. Time.com. Oh, let's see, is my ad blocker turned off? That's good. Yes, it is. Okay, so we're going to hit time.com. Here is time.com's front page. They were recently sold. Uh, we're going to let it load, and there are a lot of ads. Um, or at least there's a lot of ad code going on. So I am using a plugin here called Ghostery. And I encourage it as an alternative to an ad blocker because it allows you to block specific things instead of general things. Um, when you logged into my, uh, my newspaper simulation, you noticed there was an alert telling you you had to turn off your ad blocker to use it. It's because a lot of ad blockers pattern match. Um, so basically anything that's in the code of the website that says ad, they just block. And sometimes it breaks things and sometimes it's not the right thing. And in this case, it wasn't even something you'd want to block. Um, but more than that, they don't always operate on their own ethical standard either. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't block ads. I think that's a user choice, and if you choose to do it, you should definitely should have that ability. And I would not say we should block the content from you. Um, but I think that part of the point of this is to become a more intelligent consumer. You will like news organizations, presumably, otherwise you wouldn't be here, and you would like them to continue existing, which means they need to continue making money. And for most of them, the way that they make money is with ads. So I'm going to resume Ghostry for a second on here. And this is going to give me a list of all of the services that time is firing in order to target me and serve me ads. You can see there are 57 different services operating on the front page of time.com with the goal of putting the appropriate ad in front of me. Um, some of these are going to be more legitimate than others. And as you operate and play with this tool, and I highly encourage you to do so, you'll find that um, some of these are more legitimate and are sending you easier and faster ads. Ghostery will actually, won't do this right now because I just turned it on, but it'll actually show you a little snail next to things to tell you that this script is running particularly slow. 
Um, and now some of these are legit advertisers that I don't have a problem serving the ads. Amazon, they're going to serve me ads. It'll probably be okay. They are a pretty reputable network. Google AdSense, that's the way that Google is serving ads from the server. Um, so that's going to be okay. It's just a mechanism for, for serving ads, essentially, Say, and tracking them. Same with DoubleClick. This DoubleClick is a way that Google tracks whether or not you clicked on an ad, and it tracks a bunch of other information about you as well. You can block this one if you really are against Google collecting any information about you, and most ads should work. Net Rating Site Census is a really ugly sounding name, but essentially it's a way for sites to find out who is visiting them, where they're visiting from, and sort of the data about you and your demographics. Um, you can potentially opt out of that, but here's one where I'd say leave it on because that's how they sell ads on the web. The more direct ads they sell, the less programmatic ads they have to sell. Um, some services you might think are not ad related. Add this is a service that puts a whole bunch of share buttons on a page. Add this um, sends, your ad, sends your personal data when you load it to three different user data companies that then save that information and use it to serve you ads and will resell it to others. I highly encourage turning off Add This as script. Um, Rubicon is a particular ad vendor. I don't like their ads. I've blocked theirs um, and so forth and so on. You can see here I've blocked a bunch of advertising services that I find to be inefficient or slow while leaving some of them open so I could still get some of the ads on the page without it slowing down my browser or invading my privacy more than I'm comfortable with. That's the first way you can look at these things. Let's go into one of these articles. Um, we'll have a little bit more on the ad side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the article and inspect element. Let me move this up here. Bottom. Okay, so this is your developer toolbar. Um, if you do not already have it, what you can usually do is open it using um, like help developer tools or there's a developer menu or some other mechanism. You can Google it for your particular browser. Um, this gives you a look at what is going on inside the web page that you're currently looking at. That is an autoplay And those are really annoying. The IAB has technically said you are not supposed to autoplay an ad with sound on. So has Google. Obviously, time.com doesn't care, nor does whatever ad vendor it has put in place here. Um, so here is a look at the inside of the site. Now, you can see this is the code. We could dive into this. But uh, what's useful is taking a look at one of the more basic ads here. So you can already see some data in the code. I'm going to point out some things as we go to sort of give you an idea of what the indicators are. Obviously, they change from ad to ad. But it gets you some information about how this ad ecosystem works. This ad was created with a tool called Seltra. Um, Seltra is a tool for making ads, designing them. Um, and you can tell this because Seltra has kindly stamped its name on literally every HTML element in there. Um, you can see Seltra Oblish 681 and so forth and so on. Let me see if I can zoom in on this. No, that's not going to work. OK. Well, um, you can see that they are tracking this ad with moat. Um, now, in the ad world, you track with something called a pixel. This is uh, sort of an old way of referring to it. Back in the day, when an advertiser wanted to know if your, their ad had been rendered, they'd include an image pixel, a one-by-one -one pixel, that would load and create a log on their server saying, oh, this ad was loaded at this location on this URL. Nowadays, a pixel really represents a payload of JavaScript, a bunch of code that's going to try and find out all sorts of information about you, how you're interacting with the site, all sorts of different information depending on who the tracking vendor is. Most ads will have a lot of tracking vendors on there. You can see this one's using Moat. Like I said, they are one particular tracker. They recently got bought by Oracle. Good for them. Um, 
And we can see that this ad is hosted on Seltra's service, which means in order to, for this ad to have appeared on our site, not only did the normal set of requests have to be made, but also the ad had to be retrieved from a server maintained by Seltra, which means they probably were able to collect some data about you just for themselves. You can say that, see that this user, this publisher, like most publishers, is using Google's advertising system. It used to be called Double Click for Publishers, but was recently renamed Ad Manager. And it creates things like this, the Google Ads iframe. Um, and you can see things like, where is this coming from? So this particular ad is designed to show up on a video article. That's this tag here. That video article is apparently about health, according to whoever set up this site's ad tags. Um, it's a tier one, which probably in this case means it's positioned at the top, as we can see. And it is a time ad. This is just the domain which time is apparently using to represent itself on Google. Um, you can see this in the ID, you can see this in the name, and that gives you some information about what the publisher thinks this ad is supposed to be about when people bid on it. Now, there's positioning stuff here. You can see information about like how this is laid out on the page. But I also want to show you some information here. This is the console. You can access it by hitting the console tab. And if we refresh this page, we're going to see a lot of different things. Now, I don't know if it's a third party service or something they built in house, but Time uses a system, it appears like, called Karma to manage the placement of their ads. A lot of news sites have scripts or that they buy or make themselves that essentially manage the loading of an ad onto the page, making sure that the right ad is in the right place. Um, in this case, whoever's making the ads for time.com is not doing a great job because it crashed. Um, that happens a lot. It turns out that the people who make ads the actual ads themselves are not very good at coding for the most part, and so they end up making a lot of ads that have a lot of problems. You can see there's some warnings on here. In this case, this is the script saying, um, normally it will be putting an ad on the right rail that would stick to the screen and scroll along with you, but for whatever reason, that rail is not turned on on this page. You could see some more places where it failed. In this case, Outbrain which is that Chumbox vendor is trying to load a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't even gotten to yet. We haven't even seen it, but it's loading there on the bottom of the page and it screwed it up somehow. Um, one of the image did not, images did not load. Um, in this case, it appears to be they just screwed up how it was set up security-wise. Here's another ad crashing. Um, this is a nice set of warnings from whatever video pre-roll is playing somewhere on the page telling us that Whoever wrote the code for that video ad did not use the latest version of the code. Um, also, it apparently failed to initialize. Um, in this case, it looks like they tried to get a video ad for a video somewhere on this page. Once again, we haven't even seen this video yet, um, but they tried to get an ad for it and it failed to get the ad. There's a bunch of other stuff in here. Um, you can see here it's trying to get another ad from AppNexus. That's one of the third-party ad exchanges. It's failing. Um, and Double Verify is a tracking tag. They're trying to make sure that your ad is viewable. That means it's in view for at least 50% for one second. Why that's the standard, I don't know. If you saw half a McDonald's ad for one second, I don't think you'd realize it was about McDonald's, but that's the standard for view web viewability. Now, is that verifying just a particular ad? Yeah, that's verifying just a particular like ad. The other ad on the page. Nope, it fires. Double verify will fire for every ad that employs it at least once. Some of them will employ it more than once. So, if a advertise, if a publisher is using Google Console. There is an interface designed for advertising operations people that is publicly available called the Google Tag Console. You can open it by going to this console area of your browser and typing in Google Tag dot open console, open parentheses, close parentheses, and hitting enter. 
And it's going to tell us a whole bunch of information about what ads are on this page. Any site that's using Google's ad server, you can take a look at this for yourself. If there's an ad that is particularly atrocious that you don't like and you want to report, say on Twitter, say because you're on the Washington Post and you don't like that ad and you want to report it to me because it's bad, you can open this up and use this query ID to report it to the, to the news organization and we can use that type of information to directly track back how that ad showed up. Without that information, it is very difficult to know how any particular ad showed up on a page. Unless we see it live or get this type of information from a user, we'll never be able to backtrack it. Um, that's because of the lack of transparency involved in having all of these systems operate to show you an ad. Um, you can see all of the different ads here, all of the different ad slots, how time has defined their ad slots. You can see a whole bunch of them just didn't work, failed to fetch. Um, and you can even see information about what the timing was on this. This is telling me at what milliseconds various pieces of Time's ad code executed. All interesting information that you can use to find out more about how ads are working on a page you're looking at. Now, I'm going to close this for now. I'm going to note two more tools before we go that are essential if you want to ever backtrack an ad. The first one is network requests. That's this area here. And what this is showing is all of the times this particular browser window that I have open is making requests for information or to send information to another web page or server. Um, in this case, Basically, all of these operations, and you see that they are continuing to move, are happening because it's making more ad requests and tracking requests. From here, you can click on any of these and go to headers to see what information is being sent. That's the payload. And you can see the response. In this case, no response. In this case, it's giving whatever system is establishing ads a bunch of information that will allow it to put an ad on this page. So using these tools, you can find out a lot about an ad. What service it came from, what, where the site thinks it should have gone, even how many different vendors were involved in executing a particular ad. And if you ever see a particular egregious problem, you can right click and click on save as hard with content and save that entire set of network requests from the moment you open this to the moment you hit save as har onto your computer and examine it at your leisure. If, say, you're a journalist who's working on an article about, oh, I don't know, bad ads showing up on legitimate news sites, this is a great way to keep a record of it um, so that you can investigate it and find out a lot more about it than just taking a screenshot of it or even just recording what the ad is. Um, that is the basic rundown. Um, I'd highly encourage you to sort of do some Google searches on the variety of these tools. Uh, is the Chrome better at this than is the developer tool on Chrome better than Safari or uh, I think Chrome's and Firefox's are both particularly effective. But I closed the presentation. Um, but uh, safaris, I think, are not great. Um, but yeah, so I, if you want to look deeper into this, I'd recommend Chrome or Firefox. Um, I'm actually using a browser that uses the same engine as Chrome, but is a little bit easier to handle. It's called Opera. I like it. Um, some people don't like it because the company that owns it was bought by a company that's probably owned by the Chinese government. Um, but thumbs the risks, I guess. Um, I don't know what to tell you there. OK, uh, we'll close this uh, here. So just go and present. Okay, there we go. Oh, it popped up in here. Okay, let's get back to where we were. So while I'm paging here, does anyone have any questions? 
No? Okay. I have a question about yes. uh, when you mentioned arbitrage. Yes. So you're paying 14 cents, let's say. Mm -hmm. What do you think a typical article at a top tier publication like the Times or like the Post, what is one visit book in your estimation? Um, for a top tier publication. Let's say it's a, a kind of workday article like. So well, it's, it's not like the Kavanaugh uh, articles are probably not high value because they're associated with a bunch of words advertisers don't want to associate. Okay, so let's take that off. Um, but it's not like, you know, like the time snowball or something right. super premium. Um, I mean, the answer is usually you're seeing somewhere between, um, I'd say, $1 to $10 per thousand impressions, um, depending on the size of the ad, whether or not it's view viewable and what the overall performance of the site is over time. Um, these factors all come into what the costs are. And then on top of that, there's a whole system of bidding. Um, so I'm about to hit this, the modern ad stacks product considerations. But basically, there is a system by which when you arrive on a site, you have a bunch of advertisers are making a bid for your attention. And depending on who you are, that amount of money that an ad is worth might go up and along with a whole bunch of other considerations. Um, uh, advertising revenue is calculated as CPM, okay. um, which is per mil, so that's per thousand, and uh, it's small. Yeah, but when you say, you say it could be like $10, $10 CPM, mm -hmm. is that per placement or per visit? So, uh, no, that, so that's per thousand ads. That are shown. Okay. Yeah. So you get ten dollars for every thousand ads you show. So it's really like pages per visit, pages per sessions. Yes. Um, additionally, there's things like sessions. unique visitors, but a lot of people want to pursue something called the Wikipedia effect, which is the idea that they want you to keep going deeper and deeper into their site. Um, because the more pages you consume, the better it is. And also, if you're the same viewer in a single session, they can track you throughout that session. Let's see. I wonder if there's a good top line number that I can tell you here. So the average amount people make from AdSense, which is the default Google tool, for a large to a medium to a medium-sized site is between uh, one and six per thousand. According okay. to Quora. Uh, per thousand uh, Ad impressions. Okay, so moving on here. Let's see. We're going to talk about the uh, modern ad stack and what it looks like. Okay, so what we have here is an example of the first stage of an ad request. You, on a device, laptop, mobile, whatever, arrive on a page. What do people who are trying to serve you ads have to consider about all of this? Well, they have to consider what the capabilities of the device are, if you're doing ad blocking or not, how fast the device is in terms of processing speed, whether there's particular types of security around how ads can be shown to you on that device, and even the type of environment you're using that device in. After that device arrives on the page, it has to make a request of the server. So we have to have considerations about what is the network access capabilities of that device. Is it on a fast connection? Is it on a slow connection? Is the connection regular? Or will it be intermittent? You will get different ads when you are on a page um, in a slow internet environment than in a fast one. And then when the page itself loads, that people who put that page together have to consider a whole bunch of factors. What order are the elements on that page loading in? Are anything, is anything that's on that page that has to load blocking the ads that need to add, for, that need to load from starting to load? Um, in that vein, should these ads be loaded asynchronously, regardless of how you scroll on the page or as you scroll on the page? Is there a lot of analytics we have to fire? Are they firing in time? Are they capturing the right data? And is this page and the content on it going to be safe for whatever brands whose ad we want to see to show up on? 
Then there's the ad request itself. Now, let's say you are a high value viewer for whom the publication you have arrived on has directly sold an ad. It will make a request to the ad server with the position of the ad that it's loading, if it's ready to load and show to the user, what the network density is and how fast it can expect this ad request to go through, whether or not what the matching context is, that's metadata, tags, all that type of information, what the geolocation of the user is, and it'll pull in all of that first party and third party user data. Now, if you are a match for direct sold sponsorship, the ad server will take a look at the direct sold sponsorship and say to itself, I have 20,000 impressions I need to sell of this particular ad. I've only shown 10,000 impressions. Those are views of the ad. So I should show this per person an ad. Now, if you don't qualify for that sponsored, you're going to have your information sent over to a real-time bidding process. When that page loads, a bunch of scripts up in the head of the page are going to take that information that we've collected about who you are and what you've done and what page you're on and submit it to a whole bunch of advertising services. They're going to say, hey, here's a whole bunch of information. Here's the minimum amount we want. Make bids for it. Now, if all those bids fail, we'll get remnant inventory. That's like a default fallback low value inventory. But if they don't, we go on to the next step where that real-time bidding process begins to be considered. So that happens in something called an SSP or a supply side platform. Everything in ad tech has a lot of acronyms and they are mostly unnecessary. This is one of them. Um, here you can see on the supply side platform, this is a tool run by the publisher to present inventory to bidders. It is going to say what is the available inventory across the site in this particular request? What first party data have we specially made available? What third party connections can you come with? And what is the minimum amount we accept for a bid on that particular ad space? Then the ad bid executes. In this process, the ad that those bidding terms are sent to something called an ad exchange. That exchange considers what is the pricing? What is this ad going to be adjacent to? We don't want to show a McDonald's ad next to a Burger King ad. They're competitors, so we need to pay attention to that. It's going to show what type of targeting is available, what type of data partners are available, and whether or not this is, can be passed through to further ad exchanges. That first ad exchange may not be the ad exchange that serves you the ad. That ad may come to you three exchanges deep. But once we've resolved somebody who's actually going to bid on this ad, it goes to a DSP or a demand side platform, another pointless acronym. This is basically the mirror of the supply side platform. What it does is it considers brand safety, it considers the maximum amount it's willing to bid, and it considers what type of data and the pacing it wants for its ad, how many impressions it wants to show. Um, at this point, it may choose to make a bid or it may not. In a real-time bidding system, there are actually multiple bids from each people as they compete with each other, like an auction. Um, this happens very quickly, though usually not quickly enough. And at some point, it will get resolved and there will be a winner. When there is a winner, their request is then sent to the agency or the advertiser who actually has the ad. Um, this system is an ad server similar to the publisher's ad server and it considers all of the variables that the publisher's ad server considers, and then it sends the appropriate ad. Maybe it'll be a low bandwidth ad, maybe it'll be a high bandwidth ad, maybe it'll be one based on your custom user data, maybe it won't. That's all going to get sent back into the system, pass through each of these partners, and come back to you to finally show you an ad. These are all of the factors that have to be considered when building out an ad system in a modern website. So it's good to think about how we can deal with these, compete with them, or make them better in a way that allows us to overcome them. So there are other considerations that we have to deal with as well. Um, is it a native ad? Then we have to integrate it into our native ad system. It's going to look like a piece of the content, though if you are an ethical publisher, it will be clearly marked, and it then has to be formed in the appropriate content. We'll have to consider whether or not there has to be a mobile version of the ad, if it should be restricted because it's coming in through an app, or if it's a responsive ad, which means it's the type of ad that changes size as your window changes size, say as you flip your phone from one angle to the other. All of these things are very complicated. 
All of this happens every time you see an ad on the web. All of these considerations are taken into effect, are processed and released. And it's all to get your attention. That's what this is about. Every single ad is trying to be as precise as possible in being able to find out who you are and show up in, to repeat that person who built that Google ad, that perfectly vulnerable moment where you are receptive. And these complexities are only growing. All users should have access to their data, but the nature of these systems means that they are not transparent, they are black boxes, and they are impossible to understand where an ad gets to a person. How do we make sure that users can get their data? How do we make sure that users are not tracked when they don't want to be? This is things that publishers have been dealing with for a while, but now, especially if you're in Europe, this is becoming much more fraught, and perhaps even more fraught if you are in California, um, where a new law will be coming into place in 2020 that is very similar to GDPR in a number of ways. GDPR being the law passed by the European Union to allow people to have access to their data, be able to delete it, and be able to give, take away permission to be tra uh, tracked. So that's the system. How do we break it? Well, we have to consider which of these factors really matter. We have to take it back to the beginning. Um, and we have to think about, of all of these things, how can we provide this data accurately to advertisers in a way that is together with our users, in a way that it gets their permission, and in a way that is together with our ethics. Um, so I think that this is an opportunity. An opportunity now, while these things are thrown more into chaos by these laws than they ever are before, we can design better ad systems, better ad technologies, better ad units, and we have the opportunity to do so. One of the reasons why I encourage you to build a website is because you need to understand these technologies, but it also gives you an opportunity to think about how you can put ads in front of people. Maybe you're a music website. Why well, have display ads if you are? You can play ads in between musical songs if that's the way you're going to make money. Maybe like some ads you've gone subscription, or some publications you've gone subscription only. Maybe there's some other way that you ha can figure out to make money that I haven't thought of yet and that nobody's thought of yet. This is a big opportunity. And one of the ways that this opportunity is being realized is with a new technology that we're enacting on a publisher level that's come out of two factors, podcasts and what's called over the top. Over the top is the idea that you are getting video served to your TV from the internet. And like podcasts, it involves you downloading a file and no longer making that file available for people to bid on in real time like that system we see here. This process that puts the ad in those downloaded files, be they podcasts, audio, or video TV shows, or whatever it might be, is called dynamic ad insertion. Um, the Washington Post just launched a, launched a product under my team to handle this for podcasts. And what this does is it handles all of the decisions about what ad gets shown and how it gets shown and who it gets shown to before any piece of content ever loads. It's based on your request, and because of that, it gives users a lot more control, it gives publishers a lot more control over the entire chain, and it means that we have a lot more visibility into the management of this process for insertion. Much easier to backtrack when it's servers talking to each other on the back end than all of this stuff happening with JavaScript after you've loaded the page. But it has challenges. It requires editorial metadata, and it requires contextual tools, which is a good thing, a good reason why you should sign up for the next workshop. Because in the next workshop, we will be talking about metadata, editorial tools, how these factor into amplification, how do we handle this information into head tags, how we process these things into server requests, all of the information about how things travel through social media um, based on this metadata, how things travel through these new ad systems, based on editorial metadata and user metadata, and what happens when sites bend themselves around the metadata requirements and user requirements and the communication requirements of platforms that have nothing to do with journalism, as they have with things like Facebook and Google. Um, that is it. 
That is the link to sign up for the next version of, for the next workshop. Additionally, I will now send you a link via Twitter to this particular presentation so you can track through it. If any of my speaker notes are misspelled, I apologize. Uh, we can just pretend I spelled them that way so I would pronounce them correctly. You can all believe that. Um, that is it for this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I highly encourage you to sign up next time. Reach out to me via Twitter with any questions. Um, this has been streamed live to Facebook where it will be saved. Um, and you can share it with friends maybe. Um, perhaps to encourage them to attend the next workshop. And that is it for tonight's presentation. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for listening.